Let's be real here. The divorce rate, even in the church, is 40%. We're not getting this right. And I cannot stand idly by any longer and watch marriages around me crumble. I can't watch people be divided and split. I mean, God said it this way, right? Jesus said, what God has brought together, let no man put asunder. Let no man separate. I mean, catch that right there. God has done this. The omniscient, omnipotent God has brought you together with your spouse for an eternal purpose. And we are letting man, we are letting the enemy, we are letting finances, we are letting the job rip us apart. And I watched these people ripped apart half of what they could be. No, not even that, less, because when you rip two that have been brought together and glued together into one when you rip that into two you no longer are yourself there are bits and pieces that you lose i'm tired of watching children of divorce spun out i can't i can't just stand idly by i can't read another devotional book i can't go to another bible study or accountability group It's time to wage war. It's time to take back what was promised to us, the promise that we could be naked and yet without shame. And so, this is a call to arms. This is a call for people to get on the offensive and to fight for what God has promised is theirs. Man, Redemption Church, I am so excited to be here with you today. You're not going to believe this, but I have been attending Redemption Church for approximately three months now via online. So I am there with you guys. Um, I caught the tail end of Mark. Luckily for Byron, the tail end means like three months. So uh, that's great. Um, And I got to say, you guys, you guys have amazing pastors. Um, I'm in a season of my life where I've been in full-time ministry since 2007, and uh, just this spring, my wife and I decided that it was time to take a break. And so we resigned our position at our church in Austin, Texas, and uh, I connected with Byron, I think by, by God's grace. And I was looking for a job, but God was looking for something more, a, a brother, a friend to help sustain me through this season. And so, man, I've just so enjoyed locking with your pastor. You guys have somebody special. I mean, not only can this guy preach the freaking roof off, man, which he can, um, but, man, he's bringing something I think that is, that is really, it's Jesus, It's Jesus. There's no gimmick. There's no, you know, 10 points on, although you do do point sermons. Uh, But man, I mean, it's the real deal, man. This is the real deal. And so I I hope you guys just know what, what, what a treasure you have in your pastors, both Byron and Ashley. They have been such an inspiration to me. They have wrapped their arms around my wife and I. And I just, I, I, I don't know where I'd be this year without you, bro. So thank you so much, man. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I, resign my position. I'm no longer a pastor. And Byron's like, why don't you come and, and, and teach my church? And I was like, okay, I'm not a pastor anymore, but all right. And uh, so we, we did this marriage conference and my wife and I are passionate about marriage. Um, uh, I really do believe that marriage is, um, marriage is the relationship, the fundamental relationship that God has chosen to reveal the gospel to planet earth. Yeah, this, I mean, he puts it this way, right? He talks about husbands and wives in Ephesians through, through the Apostle Paul, right? And he says this at the end. This mystery is profound. And a mystery in the Bible is something that's dropped into our time space with little to no marketing, right? It's like Beyonce dropping an album. That's what happened here with God revealing this thing about marriage. See, he founded marriage in the garden in Genesis. And then thousands of years passed. And finally, after Jesus had resurrected, he was ready to drop this truth bomb. That that relationship, Adam and Eve, and now you guys, the married couples in here and the singles that are looking forward to marriage, that it's actually not about that. It's about something much greater. And so we're like, is it about happiness? No, it's not about happiness. Okay, is it about holiness that I would look more like Jesus? It's about that, but it's not about that. The eternal reality of marriage is actually to show the eternal relationship that Jesus has with his people. It is the gospel. 
And so we learn that every day that marriage makes it, the gospel is shown to a hopeless and dying world. And every day that marriage fails, that leaves a question mark on whether the gospel works. Because let's be honest. If the gospel doesn't work in the most fundamental relationship on the planet, two people who are, you, you know, you could sing romance songs for thousands of years about man meeting woman and them falling in love. And it feels like all heaven and earth and angels are behind them with trumpets and horns. And yes, let's do this. We've got Disney that's a multi-billion dollar uh, business that is just piping out romance and love. Let's go. It is the cry and hope of all our hearts, right? And as soon as you buy the diamond, it's like all of hell is against it, right? I mean, the reality is, last time that statistics were taken, divorce in the church was 40%. Four out of 10. That's a D, okay? That's an F. I need to go back to school. (laughs) And I heard recently that because of COVID, that it's actually climbing. That divorce rate in the church might be around 50%. Outside the church, around 60%. We're not getting this thing right. We're not getting this thing right. This is what I'm thinking about what, okay, what to save for Sunday, right? Because I want to save something good for Sunday. I really want Byron to like me, you know. I, I want to get this thing right. This is his church. I'm like, I'm like okay, I want to preach on something like courtship. Let's go. And the Lord's like, no, I want you to talk about divorce. I was like, no, that's not for Sunday. Come on, let's get that out of here. Okay, let's talk about sex. Yeah, that's what, that's what people want to hear on a Sunday morning. God's like, no, 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 no. I want you to teach about divorce. And I'm like, okay, not divorce. I must have heard you wrong, right? And so even as I woke up this morning, I'm like, yeah, it's got to be this. Because we're not getting this right. And so it makes, me, it makes me ask the fundamental question. Are we practicing for marriage? Or are we practicing for divorce? Now, when you think about it through those terms, man, everyone needs to hear this, right? Married, unmarried, divorce. We need to, what are we practicing for? Because the outcome, of course, is not giving us the expected result. Um, my daughter recently, she's eight. Her name is Symphony May. She's the sweetest little girl you'll ever meet. She's the one who walks in the room, and if anyone's sad, she's just like sad with them. She's like, I don't know why I'm sad. I'm sad because you're sad, but you're sad, so I'm going to be sad. And she's super empathetic. Well, she's very competitive, you'd be surprised. And uh, she's in third grade now, thank God for school. And uh, they're doing a fun run. And there's prizes involved, and she is obsessed with attaining these prizes, obsessed. So she comes up to me and she's like, hey, daddy, I'm doing this fun run. I'm like, yeah, I know. Are you about to hit me up for money? Like, you have all my money already, but okay, I'll give you more. And she's like, no, 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 daddy, I need someone to train me. And I was like, okay, I do not run. (laughs) That is, like, if you see me running, like, there's a murderous clown behind me or something. So, (laughs) you know, it's like it with the red balloon. Like, that's, that's what's happening in that situation. But uh, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm sure your mom will do it uh, with you. That'll be great. She'll uh, be good mother-daughter bonding. She's like, no, Daddy, I want it to be you. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, oh, well, she's eight, okay? We're going to be fine. This is going to be fine. So I haven't ran in a while. I know you can't tell from looking at this glamorous body here, but I have not ran in a while. And so I'm like, okay, I'm psyching myself up. All right, I haven't run in years. Let's go. You know, my last mile was eight minutes, and that's as good as it gets with me. But um, that's me, like, running as fast as I can. So I'm, I'm going to hit that eight-minute mile still to just show that I'm, like, still in the same shape or whatever. Let's go. So I start running, and my daughter is like, hey, I can't keep up with you. I'm like, you're eight, dude. Like, all you do, all you have is energy. Like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And she finally stopped me. She said, Daddy, Daddy, that you're being too aggressive. And I was like, well, okay, I've got this goal in my heart. It's an eight-minute mile. According to Siri, I'm on track to run a 15-minute mile. That's not going to work, right? And so I'm like, I could carry her. I'm going through the steps, and I'm looking at her, and she's looking sad. And I realize, oh, this is one of those situations where I neither need to choose to go fast or to go far. And I wonder if the way we're looking about looking at marriage, especially in the church, we've been looking at how do we go fast? Right? How do we get, you know, and we've got the license, right? In 1 Corinthians 7, it says it's better to marry than to, to, to burn, right? And so we're like, we got to get married. We got to go. Let's get this thing done. Where's my spouse? I got to find her. Let's put the ring on. Let's get it going. How short can an engagement period be? You know, is there, a, is there a law about this? And so we're just like, let's go fast. Let's go fast. Let's go fast. And I'm just wondering, maybe for a second we stop and ask, instead of going fast, how do we go far? I would rather go far than go fast. I would rather go far and keep on 
going and leave a legacy and change these statistics that just get myself into it, hoping with all serendipity that God's going to work it out because it's not working. I want to take a second, man. I know there are people in this room that are divorced. The beautiful thing about marriage is it is showing the gospel. And one of the key themes of the gospel is that God is in the business of restoring everything that has been stolen. And so if you find yourself divorced this morning, maybe God's not done yet. He's in the business of resurrection. If you find yourself remarried, guess what? God is going to restore what has been stolen from you in this marriage. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Okay, I want to get into some Bible. You guys want to get into some Bible with me? We're going to go into Matthew 19. Turn to Matthew 19 or open up your smartphone. Um, y'all are probably going to be, be bringing out that smartphone anyway, so at least do it with the Bible, you know. Matthew 19, verse 3 is where we're going to be. Take your time because I am. <laughs> All right, Matthew 19, verse 3. And the Pharisees came up to him. This is Jesus. The Pharisees are uh, some of those religious leaders who like to try and trap Jesus and would eventually uh, figure out a way to crucify Jesus. They came and tested him, asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? This is like the question of the day, right? How can I get divorced? What's the, where's the line? Where's the A plus B equals C on this? Give me the black and white, man. I just need to know. Can, can I get divorced? you got to understand that Jesus knows that this is a nuanced question. Jesus knows that there's not a yes or no on this. There's a tell me your story. What's behind this question, right? What's going on that kind of got this question brewing on your mind? And he's smart. He knows if he answers, yes, it is lawful, then they're going to go, whoa, what about you, you had said that, you know, this was an eternal covenant that you were making, and, and this is how important it is. And so he's shies away from that. He says, if he says no, it's not lawful, then he forces people to stay in abusive situations and messed up marriages that are bringing nobody life, right? So this is a nuanced situation. They're trying to trick and trap him. They think they've got him because either way he answers, he's going to lose the crowd, right? Of course, Jesus is, man, he, he knows what's up, you know. Man, you can't trap this guy. And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. See, Jesus purposefully brings us back to the Genesis account. In fact, a lot of times when the, Bible's, uh, when the Bible mentions marriage, it's taking us back to the Genesis account because the Genesis account is where we see God's purpose and design for marriage. Yeah. Yeah. This is intentional. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, he's, do you think he's talking to the Pharisees? No, he's not talking to the Pharisees here. He's talking to the crowd that is gathered to listen to this debate. And so as you guys are now the crowd, I need you to understand that marriage, when you think about marriage, we, don't think about, we shouldn't think about it in terms of 21st century marriage. We shouldn't think about it in terms of how the culture defines it. Whenever the Bible talks about it, whenever Jesus, this spiritual God-man talks about it, he's taking us back to the original design, right? The original design is this, if I could make it quick, because we just went through a whole weekend of this, right? He created man to be wild and fierce. He created man to be a captain, a leader. A man steps into chaos, and he brings order. He breathed, God's, God breathed his, his breath of life into Adam, this clay dirt man. And he now, Adam, is like his father. And he goes into chaos and breathes his life. And something, something from nothing springs up. And he created woman from Adam's side, right? Woman steps into any room. She can read the heart and the soul of man. Do my wife, man, in seconds of meeting you, she knows good person, bad person, right? <laughs> She's like, yes, babysitter, no babysitter, you know. There's something, man. Together, man and woman, a strength equal to. God had, had destined that they would go out into the, the chaos of the earth and bring forth order. He created man and woman to be kingdom builders, heaven bringers. And that was broken. 
right? Now we have to talk about things like divorce and separation. Man, so he brings us back to this account, and then he gives us this beautiful road map. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And so we see this great juxtaposition, right? The idea here is that man brings you the job. Man brings you the stuff. Man brings you the house. Man brings you the mortgage. Man brings you the hobbies. Man brings you the man cave. Man brings you uh, fantasy football. Man brings you uh, nail appointments at the salon. Man brings you, you understand that this is what, what man brings you. God has brought you a spouse and joined you together and is doing something spiritual and eternal and making you one flesh. So if you're going to separate with anything on this earth, Don't separate from the thing that God brought you together to. Separate from everything else first, right? Now, back in my my early days, I learned how to to ride a motorcycle. And Texas is so awesome for riding motorcycles, right? You can, like, just, there's this, well, it's flat, number one, so you don't have, like, the burden of mountains. Uh, But, man, you, there's just, like, these plains you can go through, and there's water, and it's so green. And, man, I used to just ride everywhere, and I was, turns out I was a very bad uh, motorcyclist. Is that the right way to say it? Uh, Yeah, so we we laid that thing down, literally, and then, and then all the way. Uh, And, uh, but I remember when I was in school, when I was in school, um, they had told me something. They said, when you're looking at a road hazard and you're on your bike, what you want to do is, is see the road hazard and then focus on where you want to go. Because if you focus on the road hazard, if you're like pothole, 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 that's actually where you end up steering the bike subconsciously. Look ahead to where you want to go. Don't focus on the hazard. And I think sometimes we're so focused on avoiding divorce that we make it this self-fulfilling prophecy and we accidentally steer towards divorce, right? We need to understand that what I want to do this morning is I want to make much of the view of marriage through the lens of Jesus and the eternal reality of what he's doing with it, that we don't need to look at divorce, we don't need to look at affairs, we don't need to look at distrust, we don't need to look at uh, you know compatibility, but we can actually look to Jesus and what his plan is for marriage, and that that would be such a lofty and high goal that our mind is not even put on those things, right? Yeah. But listen, if divorce needs to be in your vocabulary... Understand it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you're fighting with somebody, you practice for divorce when you let the word divorce come into that argument. Right? So steer away from it. And if you have to say the word divorce, may it be I will divorce all else before I divorce the one that God has brought to me. Man, and that's the idea that Jesus is talking about, right? Let no man separate what God has conjoined. You gotta understand, it's hard for us to see this, but back up and see God's point of view for a second. You've got your family, you've got your spouse's family, you've got your family, you've got your future spouse's family, okay? Now, behind me is a trail of hurt and pain and generational curses, right, that have latched on to me even since my great-great-granddaddy Adam, right, all the way back in me at eight years old, making agreements with the enemy about my parents and their lack, right? Me at 15 years old rebelling from them because they rebelled from their parents at the same age, right? At 16 years old, like wanting to be with, uh, w- with a woman because my mom had me when she was in high school. A- at 20 years old, trying to stay pure a- as a young pastor and failing. At 26 years old, meeting my wife and marrying her. At 26 uh, a- and three months, uh, I- I- her discovering that I'm addicted to pornography, right? Uh, at 20, 20 now let's see her side, right? Her side is she, she has a, a mother back here who was cheated on by her husband because he was abusing his children, right? And he was addicted to porn even though he was a sheriff and an upstanding guy in the community. He, he, he was using porn and that spun him out into being abused. And then you find out that he was actually abused back in his family tree and there's this curse that has stuck to us. And now God has brought me and her together, the porn addict with the one who was hurt by a porn addict, right? Track this. 
And God in his sovereignty says, I am doing this. Let no man put asunder. And you got to be in your, in your human mind, you got to be like, what? That is, how could you think that was wise to do that? How can we bring this person together and this person together? This person who is addicted to the thing that caused this person to be hurt, what are you doing? And he says, listen, I am omnipotent. I am omniscient. I see from beginning to end. I have allowed this train of pain to continue so that I might tell the story of reconciling all things to myself. And he saw forward to this day when a recovering porn addict would stand here and say, stay. Fight. Keep on going. Because guess what? She wouldn't put up with my, my stuff. And so I had to change. I wouldn't put up with her distrust. And so she had to change. And the outcome is that we both look like Jesus. And when you look from that perspective, you're like, oh, what God has brought together. Let no man separate. Because God is doing something we can't see. That's just the reality. God is doing something we can't see. And it's time for us to start practicing to stay. This goes for you two singles. Absolutely. You start practicing to stay right now. Man, I think this is wisdom. It's not in the Bible. This is just me for a second, okay? This is for free, all right? I think unless you're ready to be married within a year, not time to date. That's what I think. Your purity is too important. God has chosen that heaven comes to earth through your purity. And so, man, if you're ready, you're ready to be married within a year, okay? Some of you guys are, like, dating somebody right now, and you're like, <laughs> just kidding. God can, God, God can use anything, baby. Let's go. Let's go. He's in the business of restoration. He knows what he's doing, man. Even your broken heart, you have to understand, is part of his reconciling the world to himself. And listen, if I had not gone through pain, if I had not gone through tribulation, I would not be able to stand before you now and say that there's a way through, Right? Man, God is doing something. God is doing something. So, Jesus, he's not going to fall into this trap, right? So he brings us back to the Genesis account. God is doing something big. But he understands what's coming, right? The Pharisees replied to him. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? Man, this is crazy, right? If you know about Moses, and I know you guys do, uh, because Byron is, he's the man. Uh, Moses is, he's, he's a symbol of the law. And you have to understand something about the law. It never bends. It never changes. It never looks at your nuanced situation and says, oh, this is a bit of a gray area, right? No, it's, it's black or white. It's wrong or right. It's, it's, it's sinful or it's not sinful. That's the law. It's cutting, right? We, we're going to see later, Paul's going to say it's like a schoolmaster that shows us where we're short so that we understand our need for Jesus. It, it, it's not looking at the nuance, right? And so, of course, they're going to bring the law into it. Oh, it's crazy here is that you would think this is a black or white issue, right? Look what Jesus says. He said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. What's, what's crazy, what's, what's insane about this is that Jesus says that marriage is something that transcends even the law. Now, we have our laws to govern it in America, right? We have our laws on what's a lawful divorce, what's not. We have our laws on how you, how you split uh, everything you got after a divorce. We got our laws. But Jesus is saying, actually, marriage is something that's eternally more uh, transcendent than the law. The law, is, its whole point is to bring you to Jesus and then, and, then, and then show you your need for Jesus. And marriage even transcends that because it's about the eternal reality of how Christ loves the church, right? It transcends the law. I love that idea. And he says, I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. This, this passage, it changed my entire life. This verse right here. When I was writing uh, the book, I really wanted to get into the original language as much as I possibly could. And um, in studying this particular verse... I found something that really, really was profound. The word sexual immorality, the phrase there, sexual immorality, in the Greek, it's actually one word. And actually, when you read the whole New Testament, every time you see it, sexual immorality, 
It's one word. When Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 is going to say that great flee sexual immorality, it's one word actually. And that word is porneia. That's where we get our word pornography. Porno, pornographic. And as somebody who already told you my deepest, darkest secret, right? This verse changed my life. Pornography is destructive because it actually changes the way that you think. As I was going through early marriage, and I, I, I literally, I'm, I'm just going to be real with you, okay? I was questioning, is monogamy like the thing? Like, you know, Solomon had 900 wives. You know, I pr- could probably handle at least two, you know? <laughs> now, I'm starting to think through this, right? I'm like, cause, because I'm, I'm longing for these other th- things, and my, my heart, my flesh wants to go this way and this way and this way and this way. And then God, he was slowly, slowly showing me that I have actually been rewired to desire more than my wife. Here's what happens with pornography. I want to be real quick with this. It's not the point of the sermon at all. But pornography floods your brain with dopamine. Now, dopamine is that stuff that feels real good, right? It's the stuff when you eat something that's amazing. It's the stuff when you are watching uh, video games and the colors are moving fast. That's dopamine. It's just, it makes you feel good. It's, it's, a, it's a quick release of, of serotonin. It's, a, it's enjoyment, right? Now, dopamine is good because it's supposed to drive us to do things that matter. In fact, everything in this world that matters is really hard to accomplish. And so God has made it so we have a reward system that will give us this dopamine when we do something hard so that we keep doing things that are hard, right? Because bringing heaven to earth is going to require a lot of hard work, but it also gives you a heck of a lot of dopamine, right? I was swimming in dopamine yesterday after the, uh, the conference, and it's the real stuff, the good stuff, right? Well, here's the problem with pornography. It's too easy. I love this quote, actually. The problem with pornography is not that it shows too much. It's that it shows too little, right? Something that is supposed to be beautiful and symbolic of, of God joining two souls that he might show the eternal relationship between Christ and the church is, 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 is boiled down to something that is as simple as three minutes, right? So, man, your pleasure centers are overwhelmed with dopamine. And what happens is there's a compound called delta Fos b that builds up around your pleasure centers because your brain's like, whoa, this is too much. Slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. So it starts to actually layer on this Delta Foss B. And so your brain, you're, but you are, you're addicted to it at this point. So you're like, I need more dopamine, more dopamine, more dopamine. So you're flooding it with more. How are you doing that? You're doing it by looking at different partners. You're doing it by going deeper down the rabbit hole of pornography, Right? And what happens is eventually your, your pleasure centers are so covered in Delta Foss B, you can't feel anything anymore. And as, man, this next generation that's growing up will be the generation that intakes more pornography than any other generation before it. And we're seeing crazy, crazy results to it. Kids that are dealing with things that old men are dealing with. Let's just leave it at that because it's Sunday church, you know. Man. It's a sin against the body, Paul would say. Pornea is. Why? Because it changes the way your brain functions. Not only that, what's insane about this passage. Let me me read this passage. I'm just going to switch out sexual morality with pornea. Listen to this. Whoever divorces his wife except for pornea and marries another commits adultery. Pornea is divorceable. Let that sink for a second. Like when I discovered this, I mean, Jules and I had gone through it, right? She had caught me. I lied and lied and lied. Finally, yes, okay, yes. And then I'm like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm God. She catches me again. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. She catches me again. And every time, her heart is broken, right? She's acting like, like, I, like I cheated on her or, or did something, murdered somebody, you know? Like, how are we going to work through this, man? And every time, I just be like, listen, babe, this is no big deal. I've been struggling with this since I was 11. It's okay. I have great seasons of victory. I have great seasons of defeat. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then I read this, and, it's, and I understood what it finally meant, and I realize, oh my gosh, like I validate her pain now. I validate the pain of those who have, who have gone through this. Why? Because God understands that it changes your mind. God understands that it takes the way he designed you and it breaks it, right? And so God gets it if you can't forgive it. That's what this passage is saying. He says, except for porneia. 
Because God understands that after Pornea, I can't see her the same way anymore. I can't see any woman the same way anymore, right? My mind has been fundamentally changed. So God says, I understand. And we read the next part, and we think that it's the, this is to the adulterer. He said, or the, the first part, because of the hardness of your heart. And what does that phrase mean? Does that mean my heart is hard and so I went and looked at pornography? No, 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 no. The heart of the forgiver. As I'm building up Delta Foss B and can't feel anymore, she is hardening around her heart so she can't be hurt anymore. And when you harden around your heart, you cannot forgive. God says, this is so complex, and it's so nuanced, and it changes you at such a physiological and fundamental level that I understand it. And so to forgive pornography, guess what? It's divine. It's Jesus-level forgiveness. Throughout the Old Testament, into the New Testament, book of Revelation, who is known as those who give themselves to pornea? The bride of Christ the church, and Jesus extends forgiveness. Guys, if, there, if this is part of your journey and your spouse has chosen to forgive, I need you to understand that your spouse is a literal representation of the highest level of forgiveness of Jesus. Man, you grab your spouse after this and you say, I am so sorry Thank you so much for bending out grace, divine grace to me. What's beautiful is through the power of forgiveness in this particular area, that's what has made me become whole. And that's how I can stand in front of you today and talk about this. So crazy. This is in the Bible. Verse 10, it shows that the disciples understood what Jesus was saying. I want to caveat real quick. Obviously, when Jesus says pornea, when Paul says pornea, he's not talking about some website, right? (laughs) Websites weren't around back then, all right? The word word pornea in the Greek actually means to prostitute your purity, to sell it off. Sell it for something cheap, too, is kind of implied there in the the gospel. And so we see that pornea is way more circumventing than just, you know, looking at something you shouldn't. But it's thinking about something. It's, it's, It's allowing yourself to be moved towards something that you shouldn't. It's compromising your purity for any reason. Y'all are like, man, this Sunday is heavy. (laughs) I'm a little bit sorry, but I'm not sorry, man. (sighs) Man, when we forgive this, we are like Jesus. The disciples, they understand the gravitas of what he's saying. They understand how insane this is, right? And so they say this in verse 10. If such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry, right? This is too hard. This is too hard. Throw in there we have an enemy that's against us. Throw in there that he would like to distract us with every pornea under the sun, right? And how do we combat this? Well, Jesus chooses the marriage to dig down into the deepest parts and the darkest parts of your soul that the light of Jesus might be shown there and that you might be changed from the inside out. That's how. Through relationship, right? That's why Jesus would say two relationships transcend the law. That you love God and you love each other. It's through a relationship. And so I want to encourage you guys. If you're struggling, you need to open up the doors and let people see that you're struggling. There's this lie in marriage that, and it's part of how we practice for divorce, this lie is that it'd be better with someone else. Oh, this per I get it. Marriage is beautiful. I love it. I I love being monogamous. It's great. But not to this one. This is too hard, too much abuse, too much hurt. Uh, I saw this movie. It's called Take This Waltz. I don't, I don't recommend it at all. Um, but, man, it, it, it really did change the way I think about some things. I'm just going to go through this movie real quick. Um, it's got Michelle Williams and uh, Seth Rogen and some of the jabroni. doesn't matter. Those two are the important ones here. And uh, basically, Seth Rogen and Michelle Williams are, are married, and it's a happy marriage. And you can see they, they're, they're flirting, and they're together, and they're happy, and it's boring, and it's exciting, and it's all the things that a marriage, you know, goes through in seasons. And, you know, he dumps cold water on her in the shower, and, you know, they're just playing tricks on each other. And then at the end of every day, they're on the couch, and they're watching TV, right? And then a neighbor moves in, and the neighbor catches Michelle Williams' character's eye. And the whole rest of the movie is them showing how this friendship turns into an affair. That's the whole movie. 
And, you know, it's kind of like you're watching and you're like, should I keep watching this? It's kind of weird. But, man, I'm so glad I stuck around to the end because the end is this shot. And it's like the credits are rolling. And Seth gives his wife over to be with this other man. And the end is this shot. And it's the camera looking at them. And the camera is spinning. So they're in and out of frame. And when they're first in frame, you can see them just giving over to their passion. Just every, all, the, all the angst that's been building up this whole movie, they're just giving into it. Then it spins out of frame. Spins back in, and they're still in passion, but the passion has waned. Spins out of frame. Comes back, and, you know, they're, they're, they're still engaging, but it's less. It spins out. Then they're distracted and on so- opposite sides of the couch, then spins out. Then they're just watching TV together. And it was this aha moment. You're going to have to do this same work with somebody someday. In the end, it will end up the same. You're still going to have the same wounds. You're still going to have the places of deep brokenness. You're gonna, still going to have this lineage and family tree with the generational curses that, has, that have latched onto your granddaddy and grandma. You still got to deal with all that. So why not deal with it with the spouse that you have right now? Listen, it's going to be the same. In fact, it's going to be worse. Because when you break a marriage, what God has brought together, then you actually have more brokenness and more brokenness than you did before. Man, divorce is a trick and a trap. It's a lie from the enemy. We think that, that marriage is about, uh, it's about happiness, and so we're looking for that thing that gives us happiness. Meanwhile, we don't even know what happiness are because our brains are swimming in dopamine from all the trash we allow into it. And when we, we think we find that thing, we get the dopamine, but the law of diminishing returns means that it slowly gives us less and less and less until it doesn't work, until we want to get out of that one and get into the next relationship. It doesn't work. For you singles, it does not work to bounce from relationship to relationship. Just de- loving the best things about them while they're putting their best foot forward, and then once you realize who they really are, backing off and going to the next person just to find the best things about him or her, and then all of a sudden you realize who they really are, and you bounce the next, it does not work. We are practicing for divorce. In fact, let me check, let me share this with you. This is staggering, okay? You would think that the divorce rate amongst divorced people would get better, right? It's like you get divorced once, and you're like, okay, I know what to do now. I already messed that one up. No, dude, this is crazy. If the divorce rate starts at 50% outside the church, The second marriage, 65% more likely to end in divorce. Your third marriage is 75% more likely to end in divorce. This is crazy, right? We don't get better by leaving. We get better by staying. That's how you make it. Man, let me tell you why. Because I really do want to make much of marriage here. Because when you stay, when you look at your partner and you say, I know you, I see you. I see the trash. I see the treasure. I see the best parts of you. I see the worst parts of you. And I'm not going anywhere. In fact, I'm going to fight to see you become who I know God has called you to be. Then guess what? That is the safe place where the gospel can do its work through the threshing floor of conflict to change you from the inside out. And that's why Jesus gives you 20, 30 years to find a spouse. And 60 years to figure it out afterwards. Because he knows it's going to take just about that long. Listen, I would rather go far than fast. I want to change this thing, man. I want to change the statistics. Listen, marriages in the church, we should be at a success rate of 100%. And I know that's utopia to think about. I don't care. That's what faith does. You realize when, G, when, when, when a writer of Hebrews says that faith is the evidence of things not seen, do you see what he's saying there? He's saying, in my mind's eye, I can see a world where marriages make it. I don't see it here on planet Earth, but in my faith eye, I can see it. And so by faith, I'm going to pull into my present reality 100% marriage success rate because I can see a world where that would be, and I can see how that could bring heaven to earth and end suffering and end hunger. I can see how marriages stuck together for generations would accumulate wealth and wisdom and pass that on and that heaven would come to earth through that reality. I can see it in my mind's eye and so I pull it into my present reality through faith. That's what faith does. And so call it utopia. Call it it's pie in the sky. It's never going to happen. That's fine but I'm here to wage war and say stay. Stay. Get surrounded with community. Stay. Man, would we be a people that learn divine, divine forgiveness? 
Children of divorced couples are 50% more likely to marry, to, uh, marry someone and end in divorce. Crazy daughters are 60%. Very interesting. Men are 40%. It gives you an average of 50%. Divorce is a generational curse. Once it latches on to you, it wants to hold on to you. Because when you are parents or when you're children of divorce, so I'm still fired up from that last point. I'm like, let's go, adrenaline. Ah! <laughs> when you're children of divorce, you did not see how to stay. You didn't learn how to stay. And that's why marriage is, especially if you're thinking about getting married or you are married and you're a child of divorce, you need to surround yourself with couples who chose to stay. Listen. You need to surround yourself with couples who chose to stay for the long haul, the gray-haired ones, right? We need them. We need to know, how did you do it? How did you resist pornea? How did you keep on going? How did you forgive? How did you make it? Because, man, we have got to make it. Imagine how much different it would be if we started to practice for staying now. Imagine how much singles your relationships would look different. I'm not looking just for happiness. I'm not just looking for holiness. I'm looking to build a lineage, a dynasty. How much different would you do relationships right now? Okay, I'm going to end with this. Malachi 2. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament minor prophet, but major big deal, this guy. We're going to start in verse 14, Malachi 2, verse 14. I'm a, I'm a worship leader uh, by trade, been leading worship for 20 years, um, and it's been an amazing journey. Um, and there are a few passages in the Bible where it says God rejects worship. And so as a worship leader, I'm like, say what now? I got to know those. You know, I want to know what's up with that, you know. So we see God rejects Cain's worship in, in early Genesis, right? And then we see in, in, in Micah uh, chapter 6, God rejects worship if it's not bent out in acts of compassion, right? Uh, and this is one of those passages, too, where God rejects worship. And so here it says in, in verse 13, it says that he rejects the offering he says, but you say, why does he reject it? Because the Lord has witnessed between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one? That word, by the way, one, is ichad. It's the same word that uh, Deuteronomy would, uh, Moses would use in Deuteronomy where it says the Lord our God is one, already symb symbolically showing that marriage is about the eternal reality of showing Christ and the church oneness that represents the oneness of the triune Godhead. This oneness is eternal, right? with a portion of the Spirit in their union. This is a big deal. The Spirit of God was not poured out until after Jesus was resurrected at Pentecost, and yet here in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God is poured out on marriage. So interesting, right? It's almost as if marriage has this eternal reality to it that we just don't understand, right? He says, and what was that one, again, he had a play on words there. He's made you one. What does the one God want? Godly offspring. See, he understands godly parents have godly kids who marry godly kids who have godly kids who have godly kids who have godly kids on until the world looks like heaven, right? That's the idea. That's how the gospel is going to cover the whole earth. When, 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 when God told Adam and Eve in the beginning, go put the chaos into order, right? And to multiply and subdue the earth, multiply and guard and serve the earth, he had in mind that we would do that by making godly babies who choose godly babies. That was the idea, right? He says, so guard yourselves in the spirit. Protect what God has brought together. Fight, wage war to stay. Practice now to stay. And let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in the spirit and do not be faithless. What an interesting phrase, covers your garment with violence. Isn't that so interesting? I was like, what the heck does that mean? And as I was studying, I, I learned that this is what it means. It means that your legacy, the lineage that's going to come after you, is covered and protected by your marriage. That when you stay together, 
you actually are now producing kids that are more likely to stay together. You're producing kids who saw what it was to stay through all the hard. You know, my kids are going to know that their daddy is a, a, a porn addict. They're going to know that. And they're going to know how I overcame it. And they're going to know how I had victory over it. My kids are going to know that my wife couldn't trust. They're going to know that she was controlling and that she was domineering. But they're going to know how she overcame it and how she, how she rose above it and how she learned to forgive. In fact, that forgiveness was bent out in divine Jesus-like grace, right? They're going to know how to do that. And so godly offspring produce godly offspring. Here's the idea. When you break the covenant, then you're... Legacy is now covered with the garment of violence. It is interrupted. It is cut short. I need you to understand this too. Uh, divorce is a trick and a trap, not only to leave us broken hearted, but it's a trick and a trap to leave us broke. Dude, I mean, I, I watch children of divorce, man. They've got to get tossed back and forth between two parents. Uh, a struggling dad is trying to pay uh, sometimes alimony and child support to the point, man, most of the divorced people that I know that are like around our, you know, median income and stuff, they are broke, dude. They have no money. And so what are they going to leave to their kids? Nothing, right? And then the, the mom still has to work another job because child support's not enough to actually take care of these kids. So she's working another job to the point where she can't even be around the kids. And nine times out of ten, the kids are being drugged to moms and just the dad gets to borrow them for two weekends out of the week and so they're not being raised with a father and look what look what the enemy is doing here by ripping these two apart you're covering your legacy with violence you're allowing the enemy to have a foothold in and through you and your own soul not only that but your kids too man we have to see a change right he wants to leave you the enemy wants to leave you broke and broken hearted man man nasb here says for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I hate divorce. That could be read in the text here. God says that. Like, I was like, I don't really like it, but man, God said that. I hate divorce. Guys, I want to go far. I want to see you guys go far. I want to change our minds about this. If marriage is not about happiness, it's about showing Jesus to a dying world, would it be worth it to stay? Can you get a vision right now for what it would look like if you stayed and you made it and your marriage became a testimony of how to stay and make it? Can you see in your mind's eye right now that your marriage through everything you have to go through, the hardest parts could be a megaphone to a hopeless and dying world that in the end, love wins. Let's get Curtis and Jules up here. In the end, love wins. In the end, Jesus does rescue his bride. You have to understand, this is really about that. In the end, Jesus does reconcile all things to himself. In the end, Jesus does bring back what was lost. In the end, she just restores what the enemy has stolen. Do you understand that this is the essential reality of what we're talking about? In the end, love wins. And every day that you make it, you are showing to a hopeless and dying world that Jesus makes it back for his bride. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.